Hello, welcome to the 2020 uh, Summer Speaker Series for the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. Today, our speaker is going to be Jen Balava. She's a naturalist with Burlington County Parks and Recreation, and she's going to uh, speak about native or alien plants and fungi. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Jen. All right, thanks Joel, and thank you everyone for watching. This presentation is all about invasive plants and fungi how to recognize them, and a little bit about how they got here and why they're so destructive in the environment. Hopefully this is informative and you can use this to determine if the plants in your area are native or not. Now, native plants and animals are naturally balanced by predator-prey relationships, which makes sense. Our plants are eaten by native insects, which are eaten by predators, and everything is kept in check. But when we have non-native plants and animals, there are no natural predators or parasites to keep them in check. And this is how sometimes our non-native or exotic species can possibly become invasive. And the definition of an invasive species is that which causes harm to the environment, economy, or human health. So they definitely disrupt the delicate balance of ecosystems. And of the 50,000 alien species of plants and animals that are estimated to be in the US by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, of those, about 5,000 are considered invasive. So how did all these exotic species get here in the first place? Sometimes they were brought here intentionally, particularly by early European settlers, came over bringing different kinds of plants, especially crops and even honeybees that they wanted to have here in this country. But a lot of times we have unintentional introductions. And one example of an unintended introduction are those that come from ships ballast water or infested cargo from ships. And so basically, ships take on ballast water in their home port, and then the weight of this water makes the ships stable when they travel across the ocean. But when a ship gets to its destination, it releases the ballast water. And as you can imagine, the ballast water is teeming with all kinds of small creatures and seeds. And when it gets to its destination, the next port, it just releases that ballast water. And so, as a prime example, the zebra mussel, which is native to China and, I'm sorry, Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, arrived in Lake St. Clair, which is between Michigan and Ontario, in the ballast water of a transatlantic Atlantic freighter in 1988. Within 10 years, it had spread to all five of the neighboring Great Lakes. And now the economic cost of this introduction of zebra mussel has been estimated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service at about $5 billion. In the US, there's two federal agencies that are supposed to regulate ballast water discharges, the US Coast Guard and the EPA. But it wasn't until March of 2012 that the US Coast Guard finally published a rule to establish a federal ballast water treatment standard and that's only for vessels operating here in the United States. So as you can imagine, this is a serious problem with regards to unintentional introductions of invasive species. Also, when people have certain particularly exotic pets, especially things like snakes, turtles, lizards, all kinds of things, a lot of times people, when they're done and they're sick of them or they get too big, they release them into the, into the natural environment. And of course that causes all kinds of trouble, not just because the animal itself is exotic and, and, uh, and potentially causing issues for the native plants and animals that it's released into, but also they carry often all kinds of bacteria or other diseases that can be easily transmitted to our native species. 
Also, people dump their aquariums when they're, they don't want them anymore. And aquatic creatures or plants or seeds and all kinds of other things could enter waterways and infest areas that way. But the main way that exotic species arrive here is the importation of all kinds of materials from foreign countries. And for the most part, that's plants for landscaping. And that we're gonna talk about that in great detail in just a moment. But plants for landscaping, as well as food and wood and other natural materials are imported here constantly from other countries. And that in the increased global trade in all of these products, combined with the milder climate conditions in many regions in the world, is now causing a lot of our, of these exotic species to come more widespread. So invasive plants, in order to grow in a place where they're not normally found, have to have some kind of tenacious properties in order to become such a problem. And so they include things like root systems, crowding out the roots of our native plants, they can sometimes produce chemical toxins that prevent a lot of other nearby plants from, from growing. And they have a very high reproduction rate. They can disperse massive amounts of seeds or have their seeds uh, basically viable in the soil for very long periods of time. And some don't even need seeds to reproduce. They can just reproduce by vegetative pieces and of course, they're tolerant of a wide range of conditions. So the negative impacts of invasive plants include reducing the availability of water and sunlight to our native plants. They can alter the soil nutrients, the pH, and decrease the diversity of our soil organisms. They can degrade aquatic habitats and the quality of wildlife forage and that also in turn increases pressure on already stressed species. Endangered species already have obviously a lot of problems just trying to survive, but if their plants or the, the food that they eat is overtaken by something that's invasive, they can quickly become even more at risk. And then sometimes invasive plants can increase fuel for fires. That's especially the case with vines as they cause kind of, you can just imagine that fire would spread very rapidly from the ground to the canopy uh, as, as a result of the vines growing on the trees. So our alien ornamental plants that are brought here for landscaping purposes are often selected because they're attractive and they're relatively resistant to disease. And that doesn't mean they don't carry all kinds of things with them from other countries, other exotic uh, diseases and insects that we, our species don't have resistance to. And what that also means is that the plants that are brought here are not part of a functioning ecosystem. The insects that are here can't possibly eat those leaves. And that's simply because native insects that are here have adapted over long periods of time to eating certain chemical compounds that are found in leaves. And so they can't just all of a sudden consume a new mix of chemicals in these alien species. For instance, Phragmites supports 170 species of insects in Europe, where it's from, but only five species of insects in North America. Alien ornamentals can also sometimes cause food sources for native wildlife to disappear. As we mentioned, some, when they, they outcompete our native plants, then the food sources, whether it's plants or insects that fit on them, no longer have a steady uh, stream of, of food. And then also, sometimes the alien ornamentals also have berries, which can be spread by some birds. And that means that even though it seems good that it's providing food for something, these berries are not the right quality of food for our native birds. And it also means that they can spread 
further away from the parent plant, infecting more areas. Other ornamentals spread not by berries, but by wing seeds, which can spread on the wind. So either way, our, a lot of our alien ornamental plants that are brought here, as I mentioned just briefly before, not only introduces the plant, but it introduces harmful diseases and insects along with the plants. And that's a good segue into the next section. So we, we see a lot of invasive bacteria and fungi coming at, on plants that are brought here. And obviously that's a lot harder to detect. So they can infect our native plants and animals, which of course have no resistance to them and can very quickly decimate entire large areas. And so we're gonna look at some examples of invasive fungi that were brought here on mostly exotic plants. So the first example is that of chestnut blight. Now the chestnut blight was transported to the Northeast in 1876 on Japanese chestnut trees. The tr Japanese chestnut trees were brought here for landscaping purposes and the fungus was first documented on American chestnut in 1904. Now, for those of you that are a little unfamiliar about the history of the American chestnut, this tree was the most important tree in the Eastern United States, as far as our forests are concerned. They, it was actually estimated that one out of every four trees was an American chestnut. They're fast growing, the wood was rot resistant, they had really fantastic wood that was straight grained and suitable for all kinds of furniture, fencing, and especially for building uh, things like log cabins. And the nuts fed so many kinds of wildlife and people and their livestock. These were critical to the local economies overall Appalachia. So the most dominant forest tree in the eastern United States was effectively wiped out in just 50 years by this terrible uh, invasive fungus. The American chestnut is now considered what they, what they call functionally extinct and that's because the blight does not kill the roots of the tree underground so stump sprouts continue to send up shoots but inevitably the tree above the ground will eventually succumb to the, the blight and die back again. So the American Chestnut Foundation is attempting to restore American chestnuts through a combination of selective breeding, biotechnology, and also an innovative biocontrol method using a naturally occurring virus that attacks the blight. And you can find out more about the American Chestnut Foundation's efforts on their website. I want to show you some pictures. Here you can see the nut and the very spiky husk that encloses the nut, protects it until it is ripe. And the very long leaves that are sharply pointed. The picture on the bottom shows a trunk that has a canker and this is a sign of an infested chestnut tree that has blight, the chestnut blight. This is a photo that I took in one of the parks in Burlington County, which shows an American chestnut that was growing, but you can see it has the cankers and it definitely is infested with chestnut blight. And if we take a closer look on the older bark, you can see these orange pustules, which is a sign of the spore capsules of the fungus. And on the newer bark, you could see it as well. So these are ways to recognize the chestnut blight. The next example of an imported fungal infection is the dogwood anthracnose. And this fungal disease is killing our native flowering dogwoods. And while there's no definitive proof of how the fungus landed here, it is widely suspected that the prime cause was the importation of Kusa dogwood, which is a popular landscaping tree that was imported from Asia 
in the late 1800s. It looks like this. They have very dense clusters of white flowers, and sort of flat arrangement on the tree, and they have these very strange fruits. Now in Asia, monkeys eat these, but obviously here in North America, we don't have anything that eats these fruits or leaves. So in any case, our flowering dogwood, on the other hand, provides a lot of nutrition in the form of their berries to our native wildlife, everything from birds and squirrels to fox, bear. So this is, this is definitely uh, a problem. And here's what the dogwood anthracnose looks like as it's starting to infect the dogwood tree. So on the leaves, you can see the, the development of damage um, it basically starts in the lower part of the tree and spreads upward. It, it includes the, you can see on the leaves, there's tan spots that develop purple rims, and the leaves may also have brownish veins and leaf margins with large blotches on the end. In the photo on the top right, you can see young twigs. This is a twig canker where the disease leaves were attached. And that's most often seen in the lower part of the, of the tree in the spring or fall. On the bottom left, you can see an example of the brown sort of elliptical cankers that are often forming at the base of where dead branches were attached. And then finally, the so-called, what we imagine are flowers, they're actually white bracts, and they become spotted, especially if there's rainy wet conditions. So these are all examples of what the dogwood anthracnose fungus looks like. The next example is sudden oak death. This first appeared in a California nursery in 1995 on ornamental rhododendrons. But it was first recorded in New Jersey, actually in 2004 on lilac. This resulted in devastating losses to the oaks in California and Oregon. And it, here it affects our northern red oaks, pin oaks, scarlet oaks, as well as rhododendron, azalea, lilac, and huckleberry. It can cause cankers on the bark that bleed this dark sap that you see in the picture below. And the diseased tissue blocks the flow of water and nutrients followed by the leaves turning pale brown and eventually dying back. The, there is another fungus that attacks our oak trees in this area and it's called oak wilt. And that one was likely imported from uh, Mexico or Central America and brought to the Midwest initially and then spread. This oak wilt pathogen does not cause cankers on the stems and doesn't have the dark bleeding that's associated with sun and oak de death disease. Oak wilt instead typically causes red oak leaves to turn brown around the edges while the veins remain green. Both of these can be spread through based most often by moving infected plant material, such as the wood. And then we have Dutch elm disease. This was first noted in the Netherlands in 1910, and it was transport, transported to the US in 1928 on a shipment of lumber. This fungus attacks our American elms, and it's actually spread on the backs of bark beetles. The upper branches with the leaves start to wither and yellow in the summer and then it eventually spreads to the rest of the tree. These are some examples of the dieback of the elm and a picture of what it looks like under the bark showing the bark beetle feeding trails and a very blown up picture of the bark beetles themselves that carry the fungus. Now and, now and again we do find American elms growing just fine that are isolated and haven't been infected by the fungus because the beetles haven't gotten to where they are. Next we come to chytrid. This is a terrible pathogen that's associated with worldwide amphibian loss. What it does is it attacks the keratin in the 
which is the protein in the skin of the amphibians, and it hampers oxygen exchange and control of water in the body, and death by suffocation results. It's the worst case of a single pathogen causing damage to vertebrates in recorded history. It's now found on all continents where frogs live. This is a map that shows all the red dots show all the positive cases of chytrid throughout the world. It can be spread by just about anything. And it was shown to have arisen from the use of the African clawed frog in drug tests in the aquarium tree. It is now responsible for driving two, at least 200 of the planet's amphibians to extinction. And it threatens mostly frogs and toads, with some salamanders too. So one way we can prevent the spread of chytrid is by cleaning anything that's been near a wetland, our boots and field equipment with a 10% bleach solution. And also using disposable gloves if it's absolutely necessary to handle wild frogs. If it's not necessary, we shouldn't be handling wild frogs with our hands anyway. And of course, amphibians should not ever be used as bait or released back into the wild if there are pets that have been in a domestic setting. All right, so that's a little overview of just some of the invasive fungi that have, that have spread. I should also mention white nose syndrome, which was, was first documented in North America in 2006 in a cave in upstate New York. And since that time, it has spread rapidly, killing more than 6 million bats in the US and Canada. It's caused by a fungus that grows on the noses and the wing membranes of hibernating bats. And it originated in Europe and was inadvertently introduced into North America by human cave visitors, unknowingly transporting the fungus on their gear and their clothing. Now that this is well known, I have seen that some caves that allow tourists have better ways of basically sanitizing people's shoes and equipment when they're entering and exiting caves. All right, so now we're gonna spend the rest of the time looking at the top 20 invasive plants that are found in this area of South Jersey. Now, some of these are not found in the absolute heart of the Pinelands Reserve, as that section has very, very acidic sandy soil. And sometimes, a lot of times, that the low pH will prevent some of these invasive species from growing in the first place. But if there's any areas where there's been fill dirt or disturbance, then we can certainly see these invas invasive plants in that area of the pinelands as well. Most of these are going to be occurring where most of us live on the outer edges of the pinelands. So the first one is the Atlantis, which is known as Tree of Heaven. And this has compound leaves that look similar to walnut, but you can tell it apart from walnut by these little notches that are at the base of each leaflet, which walnut does not have. And walnut also has dark, rough bark, and Tree of Heaven has smooth gray bark. It has a peanut butter-like pith inside the stem if you break it, and it definitely does not smell good when you break the stem or pull it out. It grows pretty much anywhere, anywhere where the soil has been disturbed. You see it growing along highways, railroad tracks, cracks in the sidewalk, just about anywhere. And it can form very, very dense colonies very quickly. It was introduced in, the, in 1748 to U.S. nurseries because it grows very quickly and it's, and it's easy to grow anywhere. But as I said, these can form extremely dense colonies and they can re-sprout from root fragments they also release chemicals from their roots that hinder the growth of nearby plants. And cutting actually only encourages new sprouts to grow. One female tree, which you could see some of the new seeds in the picture in the top left. Here's a close up of those wing seeds. 
they can produce over 300,000 seeds on one tree. And it's spread on the wind. And as I said, they can also reproduce from, from pieces, root sprouts. So that's one of the most invasive trees on the planet. And, and now it's even more of an issue because of an invasive insect that uses it as its host, the spotted lanternfly. All right, next is the calorie pear, also known as Bradford pear. And this is a very popular landscaping tree. It's certainly very pretty. We see them blooming everywhere in springtime. They produce these little fruits later on and they sort of have round shiny leaves. But these trees can easily start to take over disturbed edges, woodlands, and fields, as you can see in the picture below. And they form dense thorny thickets that prevent our native trees from growing. We've had a lot of trouble trying to control these taking over our fields and the parks where I work. These were introduced from China in 1908, obviously for landscaping purposes. And we see them everywhere throughout suburbia and planted just about in every kind of setting. And they can, the seeds can be spread by birds as well. Next we have Japanese barberry. This is a good shrub to be able to recognize when it's very small before it becomes full grown and it gets way too hard to try to remove. Notice the spatula like leaves that you see in the pictures here. It develops yellow flowers in the spring, followed by these red berries later on in the in the season. And there's some really sharp thorns on the on the twigs. This shrub spreads by both the fruits and by vegetative parts, especially root portions. It can grow in forest, fields, or wetlands. Most of the time we see it in the woods. And it does have the ability to raise the soil pH and alter nitrogen levels, which definitely can impact other native plants around it. This was introduced as an ornamental as seeds sent to an or arboretum in 1875. It was promoted for its use in uh, as hedgerows for farmers and even for the berries used for dyes and jams. Next, we have Japanese knotweed. This is a perennial that can grow up to 10 feet tall, usually near waterways. It looks a lot like bamboo, especially the, the stems, if you see there, and it forms very, very dense thickets. They have these large sort of heart-shaped leaves with white fringed flowers late in summer, followed by these little white winged seeds. They can spread very quickly using underground rhizomes sort of horizontal underground stems. And those rhizomes can grow through even pavement and cement. So they can grow from stem parts, not just the seeds. And they were introduced purposefully during Victorian times as a landscaping plant. This is one of the hardest ones for us to constantly try to battle in Burlington County parks. Next, we have multiflora rose. Multiflora rose is a thorny perennial shrub with arching stems. It can form impenetrable thickets. You can see it has some pretty flowers that smell really nice as well. They bloom in May. Later, they develop these red rose hips, berries. And this invades fields, a lot of uh, woodland edges, and it was introduced from Japan in 1866 as rootstock for ornamental roses. It was promoted for erosion control and as living fences, as wildlife cover, and for things like pheasant and rabbits and food for songbirds, and even as highway medium strips to serve as crash barriers. This particular species is extremely difficult to remove once it's established can very easily take over an area and crowd out our native shrubs and understory. The next uh, species is 
both autumn olive and Russian olive. These are multi-stemmed trees that have very grayish leaves. When you see them from afar, they look silvery in appearance. They can invade fields or woodland edges, really anywhere that's been disturbed. They were introduced in 1830s for their ornamental value. You can see the berries that form along the center of each stem. And the autumn olive is the most common in our area. It has those very pale yellow flowers that you see in the picture below. And this was touted as a windbreak for stabilizing soil and for feeding birds with its berries. These can easily outcompete our native plants and create monocultures. This is a close-up of the Russian olive flowers for comparison. And this is a picture of the overall plant. You can see how silvery gray it looks. Next is Amer honeysuckle as well as the other bush honeysuckles. These are all exotic and they have opposite leaves with white or pale pink flowers that eventually turn yellow as they age and clusters of red berries again along the center of the, of the stems. They can invade fields, woodland edges, thickets, and sometimes wet forests and very quickly reduce seedling establishment of our native plants. They were introduced in the 1890s for the ornamental value. They came from China and Korea and they are promoted as shelter and food for birds as well. This is a good native alternative. It's a honeysuckle that does not take over. This is called coral berry or Indian currant, and it has beautiful magenta berries that form in the center of the twigs. The next honeysuckle is a vine instead of a shrub. This is Japanese honeysuckle and this can be found just about anywhere. It invades fields, forests, wetlands, all kinds of habitats. And this is doubly negative, not only because it outcompetes our native plants, but also because it strangles our shrubs and trees that are trying to grow, blocking sunlight from reaching their leaves, in addition to outcompeting their root systems. So this was introduced in the early to mid 1800s as an ornamental plant and it has spread dramatically. I've really hardly found any forest areas that don't have Japanese honeysuckle. It has these black fruits later in the year, which it can reproduce by, or it can also be spread by vegetative runners. This is a really good alternative to Japanese honeysuckle. This is a native honeysuckle called trumpet or coral honeysuckle. It's a beautiful vine that does not take over our native trees and it supports our hummingbirds that feed on it. Here's another invasive vine. This is Asiatic bittersweet. You can see it has some pretty attractive fruits. Sorry about that. It invades forest edges, woodlands, fields, hedgerows, and disturbed areas. It can smother and strangle the, the host tree, just like the Japanese honeysuckle. And the increased weight of this vine can also weaken the host tree. It has round leaves that with eventually yellow fruit capsules that break open to expose the red berry inside. You see this, these berries in the fall. Berries can be spread by some of our birds, like mockingbirds, blue jays, and starlings, as well as through root suckers that uh, can also help it spread. And the, uh, this plant was introduced in the 1860s as an ornamental and can still be found uh, being sold still in this country. The next vine is called Mile a Minute Weed is a good name. This is from China and it has these terrible little barbs on the stems. It's very easily recognizable. You can see it has very strange triangular leaves and uh, a circular 
leaf in certain stem nodes, which is where the flowers and the fruit develop. It can colonize any open area. We usually see them in fields, power line cuts. It can be spread by animals and eat the berries or just the, the pieces being spread on in local waterways. And it was introduced to our area accidentally in the 1930s as seeds that were in Asian rhododendron pots. And this can form dense, continuous mats over the surface of the ground, covering other native vegetation, blocking out their light for photosynthesis, and bending the support plants that it grows on. The uh, one good thing is that this is starting to become a little bit more under control as a result of many, many years of, of researchers figuring out what type of insect was actually host specific to just mile a minute weed in China. And this is the mile a minute weevil that eats only mile a minute weed. And it's pretty interesting because the adults will eat the leaves of this plant, but they'll also lay their eggs right on that node, that stem node that you see there. And when they do that, the larva will actually eat the inside of the stem of this plant from the inside out. So they're very effective at, at eating and controlling the populations of mile a minute weed. So now when we go to check to see the mile a minute weeds in the, the areas where they're growing, particularly in the power line cuts, we see that a lot of times the leaves now are filled with holes that look like Swiss cheese. And you can see how tiny the weevil is there on the back of the leaf. And these are at least helping to control the numbers of mile a minute weed that are growing. It'll never completely get rid of it, but at least it's controlling the spread. The next vine is porcelain berry. This is a type of grapevine with really, as you can see, pretty amazing looking berries. So it's clearly brought here for landscaping purposes. And it can have different shaped leaves, typical grape shaped leaves on the left and also divided uh, deeply lobed leaves as well as you see there in the picture. And this can invade forest edges, especially fields and thickets, and it grows over top and smothers our native vegetation, again blocking light and bending the trees and things that it's growing on. It was imported from Northeast Asia, again for ornamental purposes. And if you are familiar with the areas, particularly at near Cape May, you know that porcelain berry is an enormous problem. It's covering just about everything down there. And, and this, is, uh, this is definitely a serious invasive plant. Next is the wisteria. The Chinese and Japanese versions are both exotic and invasive. And in springtime, they have these beautiful violet flowers and fuzzy seed pods. They climb, and as they climb up trees, they smother and strangle, similar to the when we looked at Asiatic bittersweet. And they can form really dense thickets, especially near disturbed forest edges. Chinese wisteria was introduced in 1816, and Japanese wisteria was introduced in 1830, both, of course, as ornamentals. We see them all over near people's uh, decks, porches, gazebos, and gardens, and really anywhere that's been disturbed, this escapes. This is an invasive herbaceous plant, ground cover, it's garlic mustard. And this was actually brought here intentionally by the early European settlers as a year round source of garlic seasoning. If you, if you look at the pictures here on the left, this is showing the basil rosette of rounded leaves that you see in the first year. And this is evergreen. And then in the second year, it will send up an upright stalk with flowers. This is, and when it's flowering is, is the best time to pull it out. This is really one of the only invasive plants that's easy to remove. 
It grows in mostly moist forests, both disturbed and undisturbed, and it definitely can outcompete our native spring wildflowers. And the seeds can remain viable for at least five years in the soil. So even if you pull it out, you're going to have more coming back for many years to come. This this is Chinese bush clover. It's a it's a tall, upright, spindly shrub. It invades our fields and disturbed edges. If you see, it has uh, white petals, three three a clover like three petaled flower in the center of the stalk, and silvery gray leaves under underneath the underside of the leaves. And these upright stalks form extremely dense stands that outcompete our native plants. Nothing eats it to keep it in check. It was introduced from Asia in, intentionally as a, basically a way for US federal and state agencies to use it along highways for bank stabilization as well as for wildlife cover. <clears throat> the seeds of this plant are ridiculous. They can remain viable in the soil for up to 20 years. So the, the, the sprouts that we see above ground, they only represent about 1% of the seeds that are actually available in the soil. Mugwort is another plant that often grows near Chinese bush clover in an open sort of field setting. And this has divided leaves that look similar to mums. If you look at the back side of the leaf, they're very gray, silvery appearance, and they form very dense colonies that are extremely difficult to remove once they're established. They have wind pollinated flowers that can cause some um, fall allergies, and they were introduced from Eurasia by European settlers for medicinal purposes. They can be sprout from root fragments as well. And this is a close up of the brown flowers that are again wind pollinated. Next is purple loosestrife. This is a wetland plant. It, can, it has tall purple upright stalks of flowers, They're very showy. And that can, these can take over wet areas and produce hundreds and hundreds of seeds at a time. They were introduced in the 1800s from Europe for ornamental purposes. And in some cases, they can form unbelievably dense uh, concentration that, you, as you can see, would crowd out native plants and reduce food availability and shelter, nesting sites for native wildlife, especially uh, in turtles and frogs, things near wetlands. It's still sold as an ornamental, except for in the states that it's banned. But now we're, we have a little bit more uh, control. It's not as big of a problem as it was just, just a short while ago. This is the Gallarusula beetle. This is a, a host-specific predator of purple loosestrife they found in Europe. And this is naturally controlling purple loosestrife. Uh, you can see just how tiny these beetles are. They are very effective at controlling purple loosestrife. They, they basically will eat the leaves. They'll lay their eggs. They're self-sufficient. They'll keep following uh, to where there's purple loosestrife populations and birds and other uh, things like spiders still eat them. So they're not a, a problem, but they're self-sustaining and don't actually have to be constantly um, reintroduced by the New Jersey Department of Ag anymore. So these are these are doing their job and can start at least helping control the spread of purple loosestrife. And then we have lesser celandine. This is another wetland plant that grows over the ground and it forms very large dense patches that cover the ground in wetlands. They're most of the time they're very shiny yellow petals with shiny heart-shaped leaves. They were introduced as an ornamental and they spread mostly by vegetative means. They have little bulbs and tubers which are very prolific 
and they can displace our anything that's growing on the ground very quickly. It's still commercially available in the US and it spreads mostly by, the, again, the tubers which can be unearthed and scattered by digging activities of some animals as well as well-meaning gardeners and also flood events spreading them. So these are some photos I took um, along the South Branch on the Rancocas Creek showing just how invasive lesser salamine can be in a wetland. Japanese stilt grass or wine grass. This is a grass that completely covers the ground as well. It spreads by both seeds and it also roots at the stem nodes that touch the ground. It's found pretty much in wet forests I can completely take over the ground cover within five years. And it first appeared here in 1919, probably as packing material for oriental porcelain. It's critical to try to stop Japanese stilt grass from going to seed in September. So mowing can be effective, but has to be done the right time just before flowering to avoid reseeding. If that is not done, then it could quickly, as you can see, take over the entire ground cover in the, in the forest, as is the case here in Rancoga State Park. And then we have Ragmites, common reed. We all have seen this one everywhere in all wet areas, not just as we drive down the shore, but also in any real, really any wet ditch along the road, the retention basin, and they have these brown fuzzy clusters of flowers which turn into plumes like fuzzy feathery plumes that are pretty much there for the most of the fall and the winter and they can very quickly take over wetlands. They spread mostly by root fragments and they can clog waterways crowd out our native vegetation and even create fire hazard. This has been uh, extremely difficult to try to remove. There's been efforts to burn it, which sometimes makes it worse. There's been aerial spraying and it's just very difficult. It just keeps coming back. And it's really been spreading ever since European colonists brought it here, but it's even more, more so spreading now due to obviously construction and disturbance and pieces being transported on motorboats from one waterway to the next. So Cornell University in 1998 started a research project that was looking at screening uh, a host specific predator. In fact, there's two noctuid moths that are European specialists that eat the shoots and stems of Phragmites. And Hopefully, um, their, their testing will be effective and they'll be able to be issued a permit to, to see if this has any effect on reducing populations and biomass of Phragmites. And the last invasive plant that I want to mention is Hydrilla. This is a relatively new introduction to freshwater aquatic plant that can form thick mats in our creeks, and ponds, and the stems, as you can see, are covered in small world leaves. This is Asian in origin, and it's now present from Florida to Connecticut and is spreading west. This was probably brought to the United States to Florida. As Florida's areas um, are absolutely inundated with it. it was, it's an aquarium plant, and it is still being sold through aquarium supply dealers and online. Even though the plant is now on the US federal noxious weed list, you can still buy it for aquariums. And hydrilla spreads to new waters, mainly as fragments on boats and trailers. This can greatly slow the water flow and clogs irrigation and flood control canals, canals and culverts and essentially uh, can even 
can even cause problems in uh, water control uh, pumping stations. It can seriously interfere with boating, recreational opportunities, and, as, and not just boating, but also swimming and fishing. So these dense hydrilla infestations can be really se severe and impact even water chemistry and oxygen levels. We're starting to see them in the tributaries of the Delaware River. So why should we care about our native plants and animals? So what if all of these exotic things take over? Well, our native species are really running out of room. Over 70% of our forests in the east are gone. An enormous amount of area is paved. And about 40 million acres are converted to suburban lawns in this country. So what, that, what we're left with are these little fragmented islands for wildlife to live. And that's really most of the time not sufficient for their survival needs. There's a consensus among ecologists that there's just three to 5% of the land remaining undisturbed for our native plants and animals here in the lower 48. And then of course, as we just said, the remaining lands that are here are not contiguous. So we have an obligation by using our native plants instead of non-native plants, we can not only prevent the spread of these species from taking over, but they also provide natural pest control with balanced predator-prey relationships. If you have native plants, you have native insects, which bring in the, the predators of those insects, and you have a nice balance. This will in turn increase the diversity of all the animals in your yard, including birds and butterflies. In various studies, it, it's been shown that landscapes with many native plants had pest populations that were much, much smaller than those with simple landscapes, only having a few plant species. So complex and diverse habitats contain much, many more natural enemies than simple ones. And of course, most people have simple uh, habitats. They have lawn and a few non-native shrubs. So we talked about the biological implications of invasive species. What about the economic costs? Well, there's over $138 billion every year spent on invasive species control. And of that, over 50 billion on invasive plants alone. And this comes from the USGS. And it turns out that, as you can imagine, it's expensive to control invasive species, which if we think about it, are biological pollutants, unlike chemical pollutants that can eventually be eliminated from use and break down the environment over time, invasive species can reproduce and spread on and on, causing ever increasing problems unless they're prevented or at least controlled. And controlling them is not only expensive, but very time consuming. Physical means, if you're talking about plants, sometimes it can be handful, but most of the time they can't. In many cases, chemical herbicides are, are needed, or in the cases of other kinds of species, you know, obviously insecticides or fungicides to control the, the infestation. And although chemical use can be effective, it can certainly be very dangerous to non-target organisms and to the ecosystem in general and the water. So we, we really don't want to keep using so many chemical pesticides, plus all kinds of other cultural management to try to keep these in check. Now, biological control methods I touched on briefly. There are some predators, parasites, and even pathogens that can help control the spread of some of our invasive species. And this option, of course, involves much research and testing to be sure the species used will definitely prey only on the target species and not become a problem itself. So what can we do about this? 
will obviously stop importing exotic species. And one way we can help with that is by not supporting companies that do. So we can certainly stop creating disturbances where invasives most likely thrive and being more conscious of our actions outdoors, making sure that our clothes and our gear are not carrying something like invasive plant seeds or, or insects to another location. And we don't want to ever bring firewood from one place to another. Most campgrounds have rules against that now. And you can also help support organizations that either are controlling the spread of invasives or are encouraging native plant uh, native plants in nurseries. So by favoring, favoring native plants over exotic ones, gardeners can really make a big difference to stem the, sp the spread of invasives and sustain biodiversity because it's really difficult to predict which species might become invasive later on, as was the case with most of the uh, alien ornamental plants. They didn't become a problem until later. So we definitely need to limit our use of alien species and try to use native plants whenever possible so that gardens function as a community of interacting organisms, checks and balances as it, as it, how it happened in a natural functioning ecosystem. So these are some native plant nurseries that, that will sell native plants to homeowners. You can see uh, the retail establishments. Pylons Direct is the retail arm of Pylons Nursery, and they have a website where you can order plants from them. One of the best ways to find out where native plants are available near you is to go on the Native Plant Society in New Jersey's website and find a local chapter, and they can connect you with lots of resources on where to get native plants. Every year, sometimes twice a year, Pylons Preservation Alliance has a plant sale that sells um, native plants as well. Pet and aquarium owners can definitely help stem the spread of exotic species being spread through aquatic uh, wet waterways and that sort of thing. And a great resource is this website here, habitatattitude.net. It gives you great uh, information on how to, the proper way to, to uh, dispose of your aquarium. And of course, aquatic recreationists, anyone who has a boat should definitely visit stopaquatichitchikers.org. There's a lot of great information on the best ways to make sure that the boat isn't transporting anything that, that shouldn't be moved from one place to the next. So I just wanted to conclude with this quote from Douglas Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home. He says, our impact on every square mile of the Earth's biosphere has been so great that we must give up the old notion of preserving nature in its pristine form. That, however, does not mean that we must give up on nature altogether. Nature's living components are for the most part still with us, although most species are in a desperate struggle to adapt to the changes we impose on their environment daily. We will play a central role in ecological success simply by reevaluating our use of native plants in the landscapes in which we live. So I hope that this presentation gave you some insight as to how to help the situation, help prevent species from these invasive species from becoming worse, how to recognize them, and a little bit about how you can help. So I thank you for watching. And I'm just going to leave the source information for you to see. Thank you. All right, Jen, that was a very informative, very detailed presentation. I really enjoyed it. I want to thank you uh, for all your efforts today. And uh, I really got a lot out of that presentation. And uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. All right, that wraps up our uh, presentation for today. I am going to uh, stop the stream.